Hi, I'm Park Ranger Alan Schmidt, and today we're going to take a look at Antietam's Dunker Church. Battle of Antietam is well known as the bloodiest day of the Civil War, the most casualties in one day, lots of long-lasting impacts on the course of the nation. One of the most unique features of our battlefield is the simple fact that in the center of the worst violence our country has ever seen stood a church dedicated to the principles of peace and goodwill. You couldn't write a story like that and have anyone believe you, but it is all true. The church has a rich history in and of itself, and today we'll take a quick look at the background of the folks that would have founded the church and established it here at Sharpsburg. We'll also look briefly at the role the church played in the battle, and then look at some of the ups and downs, sometimes literal ups and downs, the church has been through in the years since the war. You know, one of the first questions that we often get when folks come here to the park and see the Dunker Church is, well, Dunker, that's kind of an unusual name. Well, Dunker is actually a nickname, and the actual name for these folks would have been German Baptist Brethren. To learn a little more about them, all we have to do is simply break down that longer name. First part, obviously, is German. Religion did start in Germany in the year 1708, when a group of followers came together under the leadership of a man named Alexander Mack. These folks went out into the local river and physically baptized themselves under the water. That's the second part, German Baptist. And this was really what these folks were most known for, because at the time, that was rather odd. Most baptism was a sprinkling of infants in a church ceremony. Here was grown adults going out into the river and physically pushing themselves under the water. They started to refer to these folks as Tunkers, with a T, from the German word Tunken, which means to dip under the water. What do you know? In later years, when these folks immigrated over to America and we changed to English, you change the T to a D, it sounds almost the same, means the same, and we have Dunkers. By the mid-1700s, many Dunkers had immigrated over here to America, mostly coming in in the Philadelphia area, and then spreading to the west and south all across the country. We do know by the late 1700s, there were Dunkers here in this area in central Maryland, and the first actual church they had here was in 1829 in the town of Tilmington, just a few miles north of us up the road. By the 1850s, it was decided there were enough Dunkers here in the Antietam Valley around the town of Sharpsburg that they could have their own meeting house. Local farmer Samuel Mumaw donated some of his land up here along the main road, and in 1852, the Dunker Church was built. Now, in terms of their beliefs, the Dunkers are often associated with Quakers, and Amish, and Mennonites, to which they're very similar. Basically, they believed in a very literal interpretation of the New Testament. That's where they got their baptism practices from, and they're against basically any kind of indulgence. They're against drinking, against gambling, certainly against slavery, and most of all, against any kind of violence. Again, it would make it all the more ironic that they would be caught here in some of the worst violence our country would ever see. Now, if we had come here on Sunday morning for a Dunker service, first things first, the gentleman would have entered from the eastern door over here in front of me, and the ladies would have entered from the southern door. The gentleman would sit on the right-hand side of the church, the ladies here on the left would stay there throughout the service. As you can see, the church is just as plain on the inside as it is on the outside. So all we really have are these benches. There's a table at the front where the pastor would speak and there'd be a big Bible on the table he would read from. There are no musical instruments like an organ or piano around. So as they would go through the service, it would just be a cappella singing and they would go through different prayers, different uh, scripture readings and songs, and then from the sermon from the pastor. Usually the services would last quite some time through the morning. They would have their regular pastor, many times circuit pastors would also travel through to lend sermons. So sometimes the services might be three, four hours, even stretching into the afternoon. Now as you sit down on these hard benches, you might think, oh boy, I don't know if that's something that I would wanna do. But to the Dunkers, this was their big day of the week. They worked hard all week, they came together, fellowship with their neighbors, and their religion really was the most important thing of their life. For a while, the Dunkers had a very peaceful existence here in the Antietam Valley. But whether they liked it or not, the war was soon to come to them. 
Most of the local civilians did leave their homes in preparation for the battle, so they were not here in any physical danger during the battle action. But when they would come back, what a different, different situation they would find themselves in to be impacted for a long time, if not the rest of their lives. Now in terms of battle action, we don't have time for a full battle campaign analysis here, but I'd just like to point out a few reasons why the church played such an integral role in this battle. For the Confederate Army, the church was very important because of its location. Confederates set up their defensive line on a ridge running north from town. Very good to have the high ground since they were going to be outnumbered. They ran right along the main road, which was the Hagerstown Pike. This would give them a commanding position plus mobility. The problem is, right where those two things come together stands this Dunker Church. So no one had any big idea that, hey, there's a church, let's go hide behind it or use it as a fort or anything like that. This was just the most preferential position, and it just so happens this is where the church was. Stonewall Jackson set up camp behind the church, and his men stretched off to the north and south, right in front of the church in the Confederate line. Now for the Union Army, the church was also very important, maybe more so, but for a different reason. It was very important as a reference point. All through the morning, the Union Army attacked against the Confederate line, and in doing so, it was very difficult to see. Very foggy in the morning, lots of smoke, lots of confusion and chaos. It was very easy for the commanders to say, see that bright white building up there against the dark woods? That's where the Confederates are. That's where we're headed. All through the day, wave after wave of Union attack headed for the direction of the church. The Union First, First Corps made waves from the North Woods down through the cornfield, headed in that direction. The Texas Brigade came from behind the church out to meet them. Later in the day, the 12th Corps and the 2nd Corps came from the east, pushing west across the, the battlefield, some of them even making it into the West Woods behind the church. But all through the day, the church would be in the middle of this whirlwind of violence all around it. Now, much early tradition focused on the fact that the church was a hospital after the battle. Well, probably yes and no. The church really didn't have a lot of the things needed for a hospital. It didn't have a water supply, a food supply. It's very small. But it probably was more like what we would refer to today as a triage. There would be lots and lots of wounded men all around it, and certainly if there were some that needed immediate care, there is record that they did so in the church. But more often than not, they would probably load them up on the wagons on the road right out front of the church here and take them off to the many farm hospitals all around us. The church would have continued to be very important in the days after the battle, but more so as a meeting place, again as a reference point. Commanders would have meetings with their soldiers there. Local folks would pick things up there. It would be very easy to say because everyone would know where that was. It's very possible President Lincoln visited the church as he was taken on a tour around the field when he came here, and things would continue to be a buzz of activity for these local folks. Now, for the local folks, they would have a long time to get back to any semblance of their normal lives, a lot of repair to their grounds, try to salvage their crops, and there would be wounded men here for a long time needing care. As the years went on, time seemed to pass the Dunker Church by. The area continued to grow, and finally in 1899, the local church decided they had enough folks to build a new facility down on the main street in town. Most all the services shifted there, and after that, well, not much activity took place in the building behind me. After a while, maintenance and upkeep started to, to fall off a little bit, and the church had had a rough go of it for many years anyway. Finally, in 1921, a huge windstorm swept through the valley, flattened the church about like a pancake. Suddenly now the local folks were faced with a dilemma. They'd already built themselves a new church. They didn't need this building and it was going to take a lot of work to get it back to use. Finally, they decided they would simply deed it back to the Moomaw family, which they did. Moomaw family then held an auction where it was sold to a man named Elmer Boyer. Mr. Boyer came out, salvaged what he could of the rubble pile that was there, took the materials down to his shed in town, then he resold the building at another auction. The new owner then built a new frame structure on that same foundation, which he used in the 30s and 40s as a lunch stand and souvenir counter. So you have come here to the battlefield at that time, let's say for the 75th anniversary of the battle, 
standing in that spot would have been a lunch stand with big loud signs on top saying ham and egg sandwiches and ice cold beer and much much different situation than what we had during the time of the battle. Many efforts over and over through the years were made to try to regain the land, but all of them seemed to fall short in one way or the other. Finally, in 1951, the Washington County Historical Society was able to purchase the land back and they tore the frame structure off of the foundation. Still took many more years to get anything done though. If you'd have come here in the 50s, would have simply been a bare foundation there. Finally, in 1962, in preparation for the centennial celebration, funding was finally available to reconstruct the church. The state of Maryland provided the money, the National Park Service provided architects and buildings to get it done. Finally, the dedication came September the 2nd, 1962, a large crowd gathered, and finally, from that point forward, the church would be back in its rightful place. Today, the Dunker Church still has many uses here at our battlefield. Many public uses, like it's used for weddings or for recording music. It's also a checkpoint for several charity walks and bicycle races. And also, we try to use it for interpretive programs, try to use it for ceremonies, try to really incorporate it as an important landmark of our battlefield. But I think in the end, the true value of having the church here is just the simple fact that you can go inside, you can sit down on the hard benches, you can listen to the voices echo, you can look out the back window and just see trees and really try to get yourself in the right frame of mind to appreciate what happened here. When you have such devastation, such impact, such a magnitude of loss, it really does take on kind of a, a spiritual, solemn sense to everything. So the fact that we have this church here and you can go in and reflect, get yourself in the right mindset, really appreciate the sacrifice and the loss that happened here on the field. I will leave you today with the words of Maryland Governor Millard Taws, who spoke at the rededication in 1962. He said, may this church stand in peace as it did in battle, as a beacon to guide those searching their way through the darkness. May it stand throughout all ages as a symbol of mercy peace and understanding.